adding up to what we know, a global perspective on fertility treatment add-ons. The hashtag for this event is IVF add-ons, and this event is taking place as part of the Queen Mary University of London's Remaking the Human Bodies project, which is funded by Wellcome. Kirsty is a senior embryologist at the Salgrenska University Hospital's Reproductive Medicine Laboratory, and she's associate professor at the University of Gothenburg. I'm chairing together with Anja Pimbor from Denmark. I'm chairing the Escher Working Group for Good Practice Recommendations on Add-ons in MAR. And we are a group of about 10 people from uh, all parts of Europe and all professions. It's something that's not really essential for the treatment to, to work at all, but it's an optional intervention that is added on top and most often at an additional cost. And of course, the aim is to potentiate the effect of the treatment or possibly to lessen side effects. And as you also said, it can be proven to be effective uh, and safe or not. And it's usually at an extra cost. And I think it's important to, to state that because add-ons often have sort of a negative uh, um, tinge to it. But uh, I think we need to realize that they can actually be beneficial or detrimental. The, the problem is that usually we don't know. So we, we, we shouldn't just throw them out, but we should look at them more closely, of course. So what about add-ons in medically assisted reproduction? When I sit together in groups with people from other medical fields, they usually get very tired of me because I always tell them how special we are in medically assisted reproduction. Uh, but I actually think we are because we have a bit of a different uh, situation. Our patients are often young and mainly healthy apart from their, their infertility situation. Uh, they are often more on the desperate side. They really want to have their children and possibly uh, yesterday or the year before. And that means they do have a strong voice. They are often willing to try lots of things that we in the profession would feel is not really maybe an advantage. And many of them are willing to pay as well even if it hasn't been proven to work. And also the other thing about MAR, which differentiates, differentiates us from many other medical fields, is that it's mainly in the private sector. So it's highly commercially driven and comp competitive field, which needs to get out things on the market quickly uh, and speedily, and often without much proof of efficiency or validation of safety. And we need to re realize that there are loads of money in this. And the third thing that I want to point out is that this is not only about the patient per se, but it's also about a possible future child that we need to, to think about consequences for. So uh, as we heard as well, there are a, a wide range of treatment uh, add-ons that can be offered, lots of different tests, uh, uh, drugs, alternative therapies, uh, special equipment, uh, often very expensive. Uh, laboratory interventions and surgical interventions and so on and so on. And of course, what we want to do to have and the patients want to have, all of us want that is to have improved pregnancy rates and especially live birth rates, of course. Uh, we want to reduce the risk of miscarriage and if possible, shorten the time to pregnancy. So uh, Esther thought this was a very important topic and uh, we do produce uh, guidelines on different uh, areas, a uh, couple per year. Uh, so this one will be put into our, our group of, of guidelines or recommendations. And the aim of course then is to, to, to give recommendations that are useful for professionals, for patients and policymakers and, and for the society uh, as a whole. So we perform this as a structured analysis uh, with a structured literature search a uh, selection of, of relevant papers by the uh, uh, experts involved. Uh, then we will we'll, uh, put together a narrative summary and of course have a discussion of implications for uh, applying the different add-ons uh, uh, and give recommendations. This will of course, of course be put on a stakeholder review uh, before any publication. So in our list, I won't I won't give you the list because it's very early days for us yet and it's not fully decided everything. But I can tell you that so far we have uh, identified uh, 33 different types of interventions. Uh, some of these 33 um, 
numbers, they include several things that are headed into the same, same, uh, same group. And we have divided them into four categories. So we have divided them into diagnostic tests, and I've just put down some examples here. Um, could be immunologies, sperm binding assays, error tests, and so on. Uh, laboratory interventions, for example, egg activation, mitochondria transfer, sperm selection uh, uh, methods, assisted hatching, uh, clinical management, it could be platelet-rich plasma, uh, infusion of that, or infusion of seminal plasma, additions to transfer media, stem cells mobilization, scratching. And then we have the fourth groups, which we have dis discussed a lot what to call, but at least where we are now is that we call it selective add-ons. Those that have maybe very uh, efficient in some patients and in some for some use, but not for others. For example, ICSI, I think, is an excellent example of this. ICSI, of course, is necessary for some patients, but why use it for all? And if you use it for patients where you have no indication and even you, you, you uh, ask the patient to, to, to pay for it, is that, is that something we should uh, um, um, allow? Same PGTA for everybody. Time-lapse is a fantastic machine. I love time-lapse but does it give any benefit to the patient and should they pay for it? So this is a really difficult group, I think. The outcomes that we measure in this structures analysis will be efficacy, costs and risk. And as I said, efficacy will be pregnancy or preferably live birth rates, uh, risk of miscarriage and uh, time to pregnancy. So uh, what can we discuss in this? Uh, of course, lots and lots and lots of things. This will be a difficult part. Uh, we need to discuss uh, if if uh, if it's pos if we should allow selling, adding or even selling treatments that have not shown to be safe, treatments that have not shown to have any effect, and what about the overuse? These are then I mean, for example, these selective treatments, ICSI for all, PGS for all, over treatment perhaps. Uh, some drugs or tests, so the tests mainly may may uh, cause the patients to go into a treatment too early. Maybe it's not necessary for them. It could be on the wrong indication. So we need to look at, are we providing, uh, you know, to what extent I would say, because we are, but to what extent are we providing unrealistic expectations for our patients? How are the different, different treatments marketed? What are the information that patients are given? And what are the patient's rights? This is not for me to discuss. I think this will be come more later. But if a patient knows fully well that this is not efficient, but it's not harmful, uh, is it right? Or should they be allowed to pay for it, even if we know it doesn't work? Is that, is that something that we should go for? Uh, so uh, Esther's role in this and, and all of our role, I think, uh, H HFA and, and everybody, is, is that we need to ensure the rights of our patient that they receive treatment for their infertility that is based on evidence, on safety, on clinical efficiency, and that has a, a patient focus. The next speaker this evening is Dr. Manuela Perota. And Manuela is the um, principal investigator at the Remaking the Human Body project. Just to give you a bit of background, this is a large qualitative study, which has included observations in IVF clinics and IVF related events, a total of over 120 interviews individually or in group with patients, partner and a variety of IVF professionals and a patient survey with more than 300 participants. Um, so as we started today, uh, already defining what is an add-on or what should be counted as an add-on was one of the first challenges we encountered in the research. In the slide, I'm reporting some of the essential characteristics that are uh, from the definition that we have that is offered by the HFEA, the UK regulator of the field. So as has already been said by the previous speaker, add-ons are optional, so they are not essential to the treatment. Uh, some clinic chart additional costs for this add-on, which can be very expensive, or some of these are very expensive. But the main problem with add-ons is related to the claims of their ability to improve patient chances of having a baby, which are not currently supported by robust evidence, as has been already said. 
although I will not focus on this, on this aspect in this talk tonight, in our research project, we have extensively explored the debate on evidence in IVF and the reasons for the current lack of, of scientific evidence in this field. And you can find several publications on this topic of our, on our blog, and they're all available open access. So if you're interested in this specific, you can see more there. Um, the first question I would like to address tonight instead is the variety of views from our research participants on what for them count as add-ons. So for instance, in our patient survey, we asked participants if they had or they were planning to have any additional treatment without offering any definition of add-ons or referring to any specific list. 45% of our respondents say they included one or more additional treatment or they were considering to do so. So the image that you can see on the screen is a visual represent representation of the frequency and the types of additional treatments that were included in these answers. I hope you can see from the image the variety of tests, treatments, medications, and the number of other things that were actually mentioned, we, uh, which included over 60 different options, some of which are not usually considered add-ons, at least not in the British public debate. The diversity of perspectives on what count or should be as or should be considered an add-on was also reflected in the interviews we conducted with both IVF professionals and patients and their partners. Here, I would like to highlight some of the more some common issues that emerged, starting with the perspectives of the professional. So first of all, many suggested that an add-on is, and I quote, anything that is added to the invoice, therefore underlining the cost element for patient. This view very often was linked to some uh, concern because of the risk of financial harm to patients. Several professionals, though, suggested that even when patients are not individually charged for a specific treatment, if this is more expensive than the standard alternative, this still represents a cost that should be carefully justified in the absence of evidence that such a treatment is more effective than the standard one. A second point, um, very often discussed by professionals was the distinction between what, the, what they call add-ons that are considered low risk and add-ons that are instead considered controversial in the professional community. And similarly, a third distinction was made between add-ons that are invasive and therefore considered more problematic and compared to non-invasive add-ons, which were seen as less contentious. Several professionals suggested that these two groups should be regulated with different rules. We also explored the perspective of patients and partners on add-ons, and in particular, how they take decisions regarding their treatment and what should be included in their treatment. In this case, too, we found a wide range of points of view and very different perspectives in, in our group. So some patients were actively seeking information on add-ons through a variety of resources and were very determined to have certain treatments included in, in their cycle, especially when they hadn't been successful in previous cycles. Other patients felt it should not be their responsibility to assess the effectiveness of the treatment, and they want to delegate their decisions on their medical treatment on their consultants. Our interviewees underlined that the decisions of including add-ons or not in their treatment have to be understood in the broader context of their own personal experience of infertility and IVF. Some patients emphasize the need to accept what they defined as the experimental nature of IVF to refer to the limited success rates in general and the need to find a treatment or a combination of treatments that could work in their specific circumstances. Others instead focus more on what has been called regret aversion to underline that patients need to try everything available or they feel they need to try everything available to avoid future regret. A third key result that I would like to underline of our research is patient view on the mixed provision of fertility care in the UK. While in the British public debate, there is a neat distinction between NHS and private treatment, our interviewees described more mixed experiences. First, some patients treated in NHS clinics are self-funded, while NHS-funded patients are sometimes treated at private clinics. Second, because of the unequal access to funded cycles, what is usually known as the postcode lottery, in most cases, patients are entitled to only one or two NHS-funded cycles. And as they are highly aware of the possibility that one or two rounds uh, might not lead to a baby, they anticipate future private treatment very early in their experience of IVF. 
Third, this mixed provision has consequences on how patients perceive add-ons and their relevance. For instance, patients who had a certain treatment included in their NHS cycle will want this to be included in the following self-funded -cy self cycles, in the, in, in, even when they go private. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've done extensive work on the production of evidence, but tonight I want to focus more on how professional and patient interpret what are the available information on evidence supporting add-ons in the UK. Uh, the UK regulator, the HFEA, has introduced what is known as the traffic light system in 2017, which presents an assessment of the current available evidence on the most widely offered add-ons, at least in the UK. In this system, red means there is no evidence supporting a certain treatment, amber means there is conflicting evidence, and green means that there is evidence to prove that an add-on is effective. I will not go into any further detail on this, as I'm sure our last speaker uh, will cover this. Uh, more. Um, I would like instead focus my attention on the on the wide range again of perspective that we collected on how per professionals and patients interpret the available the available information on the evidence supporting add-ons. So setting with professional, they have very different interpretation of the traffic list um, traffic light system itself, especially regarding add-ons marked as amber. So some are suggesting that although they have not yet been proven. At the moment, these are the most promising add-ons. Others instead are very concerned about this group because what they suggest is even though this might seem less problematic, these are still um, treatment that are not supported by evidence. An additional point, as an additional point, some professional underline that although add-ons were not helpful for the broader IVF population, they might be useful for some specific subgroups of patients and that they're often offered as the last resource where the other attempts have not worked. Uh, similarly, patient perspective differed widely. Many patients we interviewed did not know that the HFEA website provides information about add-ons specifically for patients. Patients generally engaged in extensive online research, including websites such as the NHS A to Z directory and a variety of peer support groups and websites. And finally, patients do not always feel equipped to evaluate the effectiveness of add-ons in their specific circumstances. So I would like to conclude offering some recommendation on how to support informed decisions on the base of our result. Firstly, it's important to coordinate the provision of already available information about add-ons to improve the clarity, visibility, and accessibility of this information. So for instance, directing IVF patients from the NHS A to Z website to the HFEA website, where this information is already available. Secondly, including in the rating system information reg regarding other relevant criteria for patients besides live birth rates. These are such things such as risk and potential harm, reduction of miscarriages, reduction of time to conception. And thirdly, including different layers of information on available evidence for those patients who need and want more detail and would otherwise rely on less accurate and impartial resources. Our next speaker this evening um, is Dr. Sarah Lenson. I'm presenting about IVF add-ons from the context of Australia or Australasia to include New Zealand. So um, in Australasia and particularly in Australia, IVF is largely provided by large corporations or companies, um, many of which are listed on the stock exchange. And IVF is also subsidised by the government. So approximately 50% of the cost of IVF, patients can get that back as a government rebate. And there's very few restrictions on um, eligibility for these subsidised IVF cycles. So while in places like New Zealand or the UK, there might be restrictions on accessing funded IVF in terms of um, patients' BMI, whether or not they smoke, how long they've been trying to conceive, there's very few of those restrictions here in Australia. And as, large as, as long as the IVF doctor sort of labels you as having infertility, then you can access subsidised IVF from the government. Additionally, there's no limit on the number of cycles that patients can access. So they can go back and back and back and have multiple um, subsidised IVF cycles here in Australia. Probably for these reasons, we have a very high utilisation rate of IVF in Australia. So 
the number of IVF cycles undertaken per capita here is one of the highest in the world at 2,600 cycles per million per year. And some have speculated that places that have um, a commercial sort of IVF, IVF industry might have a higher um, rate of add-ons. So I'm presenting um, the data from Australia today. So if we look at the official data from ANZARD, which is a group that collates um, IVF cycle data and success rates from Australia and New Zealand every year and produce um, this great report. Unfortunately, there's not much data in the report about add-ons. So the two um, items that are reported, uh, which might be considered add-ons, are assisted hatching. So um, in 2019, 9% of um, IVF cycles had used assisted hatching here. And also PGT, pre-implantation genetic testing, uh, was reported in 14% of, of cycles. Um, however, PGT here includes both PGTA or testing for aneuploidy, which is something that we, we often consider to be an add-on, but it also includes PGD, uh, testing for inherited genetic disorders, which we, which we wouldn't consider to be an add-on, and we can't unfortunately tease these apart in this data, although it's likely that the majority of that 14% is PGTA. Uh, so myself and some colleagues recently performed an assessment of IVF clinic websites in Australia and New Zealand um, to get an idea of what add-ons are being offered here. So we found that um, from the 40 different websites that we looked at, almost 80% listed one or more add-ons as being available there. And in total, there are 21 different add-ons. The cost of the add-ons also varied quite a lot from, from being free, um, possibly in the case where add-ons are offered routinely or as part of um, treatment packages, up to about $4,000 um, or £2,000. Uh, the most commonly um, advertised add-ons on these websites were PGTA, time-lapse and assisted hatching. And we also noticed that um, many of the descriptions about add-ons were accompanied by claims of benefits. So this happened three quarters of the time. And I've just uh, picked a couple of excerpts from websites um, as examples. So the first one says, before transfer, we also put the embryo in a special substance called embryo glue to boost the chances of it implanting in the uterus. Uh, and the second example is about PGTA, which states embryos with the correct number of chromosomes can then be selected for transfer, which improves the chance of pregnancy and the development of a healthy baby. Um, obviously, this data from, from clinic websites doesn't paint the whole um, picture. It doesn't tell us, um, for example, about add-ons that the clinic might be using, but which aren't on their website or um, websites might be out of date. And also the fact that an add-on is available doesn't really give you any kind of good idea about how frequently it's actually being used. So because um, we couldn't find this data anywhere else, we decided to conduct a survey of IVF patients in Australia. Um, the main aims of which were to um, get an idea of what add-ons are being used here and roughly um, the prevalence of use. We were also interested in the cost that patients were paying for these how the patient viewed the role of themselves and their doctor in driving the use of add-ons and in making the final decision whether to use them, and also what they thought about scientific evidence. So we, uh, we conducted a survey of women who had had IVF in Australia in the last three and a half years, uh, and we recruited for this survey online, mostly via Facebook. Um, and we also pilot tested the survey quite extensively um, amongst our research team and in a, in a panel of patients um, just to check for, for comprehension and clarity of questions. And of course, we had ethics approval for the survey. So we published it last year and we had almost 1,600 included responses. Um, and we found that add-on use is quite prevalent here. So 82% of women had used at least one add-on during uh, the last three and a half years of their treatment journey. And by far and away, the most commonly used add-on was acupuncture, um, used by almost half of all women in the survey. And I should note that this is acupuncture specific to, um, to IVF or having it alongside um, an IVF cycle, not acupuncture that's been used for more um, general lifestyle or other specific health conditions. Uh, and the second 
two most frequently used add-ons were PGTA, um, pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy and Chinese herbal medicine. So in the top three, there's two um, sort of complementary or alternative medicines being used uh, in Australia. Unsurprisingly, we also found that most of the time these add-ons cost patients extra. Um, and we also observed that 50% of patients believe that the add-on that they used wasn't associated with any risk uh, whatsoever. Um, patients reported that they'd first heard about the add-on from their doctor. And when they had a discussion with the ad about the add-on with their doctor at the clinic, the one who brought it up, who raised the idea was the doctor. 71% of the time. Um, but the patients also reported that the ultimate decision on whether or not to use the add-on was equally shared between themselves and the doctor, so that they didn't feel that the doctor or themselves had a greater role than the other party in the decision to use the add-on. In terms of scientific evidence, we asked patients to rate how important out of 100 they thought evidence, scientific evidence of effectiveness or it improves the chance of having a baby and safety was. And so in these box, box, box plots, you can see um, the median important score for effectiveness is about 90, very high and for safety um, close to 100. So patients rate the importance of scientific evidence very highly in their decision-making process. Um, but it's also interesting to note that although um, they report to rate evidence is very important, we also know that most add-ons aren't supported by robust evidence that they're effective and safe, and yet add-on use is very common. So um, this sort of feels like something's amiss, and one possible explanation could be that patients aren't adequately informed about the benefits and risks of, of these add-ons when they're making a decision. And that kind of um, reflects the evidence we found in the website review where lots of statements were made about um, add-ons being uh, beneficial. I just wanted to um, give an example before I end about one add-on called endometrial scratching. So this is um, an add-on that was um, quite common and we conducted a survey in 2015, which essentially asked um, clinicians in Australia, New Zealand and the UK um, if they use endometrial scratching and we found that 83% did offer or recommend it and 73% believed it to be beneficial, especially for recurrent implantation failure. And on average, the procedure cost about 190 pounds. And since the time of this um, survey, a number of um, studies and high quality randomized controlled trials have been published, which don't report any benefit from endometrial scratching or at least um, a much smaller benefit than we, we might've thought. And so we repeated this survey um, last year and the paper has been published. And we observed that far fewer clinicians now report to offer or recommend this procedure um, and, and fewer of them believe that it is beneficial for recurrent implantation failure. Uh, so I think this is a really reassuring finding. It shows that IVF um, clinics and clinicians are really responding to new evidence when it comes out um, and altering their practice. One extra finding um, in the more recent survey, which I thought was interesting, was that when we asked the doctors what they thought the, um, the benefits of endometrial scratching were. The one that was um, most commonly selected was that it reduces distress. So in patients who, um, who are desperate, who, who really um, want to have the procedure done, offering it or making it available to their patients has this benefit of reducing their distress, which was, I thought was an interesting um, benefit or finding. Satu is the chair of Fertility Europe and she is also the um, secretary of the Infertility Association Simpok in Finland. Thank you very much uh, Progress Educational Trust for inviting me to this uh, session and to give the patient's voice. I have been involved with Fertility Europe since 2009 when it was originally registered uh, and I have been the chair for the past five years. Fertility Europe is an umbrella organization of European infertility patient associations. We have currently 26 member associations uh, from 24 European countries. We are the voice of over 25 million people in Europe facing infertility. My daytime job is in the Finnish Infertility Association Simpukka, where I have worked for 13 years now with infertility patients. I am also a former fertility patient myself. 
ending up with no children with my husband. As this topic about add-ons concerns infertility patients, let's talk first about what it's like to realize that your dream about having children didn't come true like you thought it would. Having children is considered to be normal and taken for granted. People get pregnant all the time. Everybody around you are pregnant. Your sister, your colleagues, your friends, but not you. So something is wrong and you try for a year, maybe two, and the despair grows month by month. You start Googling, you join support groups, you write to forums and search for answers, tools, medicine, non-medicine, diets, treatments, anything that could help you with the situation. You experience hope, anger, disappointment, frustration, all the feelings there can be. A Harvard study from 2009 found that women dealing with infertility felt as anxious or depressed as those diagnosed with cancer. Infertility shatters your life into pieces. This is not the way it was supposed to be. I have heard of women who have basically mixed their own medicine because they have read it, read it might help, but can't get it from their own pharmacy. So this is how it feels like when you are running out of tricks how to get pregnant. Science has found many ways to solve these problems and made it possible for over 8 million babies to be born with the help of fertility treatments. And science is generating more ways all the time, finding new information about the way how new life can be helped and parents to have their long expected babies to be born. Earlier this evening, we have already heard definitions to what add-ons are, but believe it or not, despite the various ways to find information, that is not clear to the patient. In fact, it was not clear to me either earlier. Only during the past two years, this discussion has been arising to my knowledge. And among our member associations, it has not been a topic of discussion yet. But I do know it is uh, widely discussed in, in the UK at the moment. During my treatments, I used add-ons, but I didn't know that then. I just took everything I was offered and crossed my fingers that it will help. And it looks like this is still the situation with the patients. For this event, I made a small scale survey to our members. And please remember, I am not a scientist, not, not at all. So this was just a little survey to our members. And the first interesting feedback after releasing the survey was that one of our member association a representative already said no add-ons are used in their country as their doctors don't do unproven treatments. In the survey, 55% of the respondents said they learned about add-ons from internet and 33% heard about them from a private clinic. It's of course not a surprise that internet is the major source of information. But the problem with internet is that it is extremely difficult to find unbiased and accurate information. And patients are not scientists. Already the language and the terms used can make it difficult to understand it if an add-on is useful or worth trying. You need to trust someone to make the decision on your behalf or just try your own trust your own evaluation. 93% of the respondents were interested or excited to learn more. This shows how eager people are to find information and to grasp to any ways to help them. Like I already described in the beginning how it feels like to be an infertility patient, you can imagine that patients catch every tiny little piece of hope or possibility to uh, they see or hear. The hope rises and you want to hear more, but who is responsible for this information? 69% of the suggested add-ons were treatment add-ons. When you are in the middle of this endless journey of doctors and clinics and syringes and hormones, a new invention or experiment is easily heard as a solution to your situation. I know I've been there too. I was offered a new treatment and I took it with no hesitation, none at all. But how can we guarantee that the patient today knows what she's getting involved with? 
who has the best knowledge, who says it's worth trying, who guarantees it's safe. When they were asked if they thought they got enough information about the benefits of the add-ons suggested, 44% said they did, but 29% said they didn't. And what is more alarming is that 20% of the respondents couldn't even say if they knew or not. So we can say that half of the patients didn't even know if the add-on was useful to them or not, but they still wanted to try. But when we ask if they think they got enough information about the risks and disadvantages, 65% said they didn't or were unaware if they did. So this again shows that even though some patients are told about the benefits, most of them don't know if it's safe. They hear the positive side, but either aren't told or don't ask about the risks, or the issue is just ignored. Half of the respondents said they feel that they either didn't get any help <coughs> or were unaware if they got any help from the add-on to get pregnant. It is of course not possible to say always what helped and what didn't help. In some comments, patients were totally sure that an add-on was the, the, the one that helped them get pregnant. Some said they thought it increased their chances, but were disappointed it didn't work. Almost 70% said the use of add-on made them feel more hopeful during the treatment, and this is of course understandable. The hope rises again, and this explains why the decision to try any help that is available is made. Another thing is the financial side of add-ons. When we asked what they thought about the price of the treatment add-ons, over half of the respondents said they were expensive. One respondent from Poland told about an error test which costs 800 euros in a country where median monthly wage is 1,000 euros. So, conclusions. What we need is proper, truthful information, proven treatments not using patients as kinebigs against their knowledge, honest discussion about the benefits and risks, and respectful attitude to patients and not making use of their difficult situation. This comment from the survey tells a lot. I know these are not proven to be effective, but in some cases, when you don't have anything to lose anymore, they should be offered. If it doesn't hurt and it might help, I support it. Sigal is chair of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine's Ethics Committee. Um, her day job is um, as an obstetrician gynaecologist and director of the egg donor program at Invia Fertility in Chicago. Thank you very much. I really think that I'm going to reaffirm much of what was previously said and perhaps uh, give a little bit of uh, an American perspective here. Uh, perhaps we do things a little bit uh, differently, or at least our approaches are a little bit different. Um, so I will say it's quite interesting, but the discussion about add-ons has not been so dominant or top of mind in the US as it appears to be in much of the rest of the world. Um, not to say that it hasn't been discussed. This is a, an opinion piece from the New York Times from a couple of years ago on the big IVF add-on bracket. Um, this is no way to treat patients desperate for a baby. And as others have said, one needs to weigh the efficacy with the cost and the safety um, the question then becomes, if something is not efficacious, but is not costly and, and is safe, then should it be offered? Um, I will say that is some of the, uh, in the US, the model is mostly self-pay for uh, IVF treatments, with the exception that a number of states have mandated insurance coverage, but by private insurers uh, to cover fertility treatments. And a few of the insurers um, cover PGT for aneuploidy uh, for anybody that's eligible for IVF. And so then the question then becomes, is this an add-on um, and where does cost play a role in the um, uh, definition of something as an add-on? Now, of course, as others have said, um, assessing the science is important and, and we uh, put out um, a, a committee opinion on moving innovations to practice. And of course, all innovation starts with a theory or a presupposed uh, assumption. Uh, it can be based on anecdotal evidence, much of uh, what we do started that way. 
Um, but the, the pathway from innovation to standard of care is experimentation. And so ideally, uh, if possible, prospective and randomized studies would be performed with efficacy and safety being top of mind and peer reviewed uh, by experts in the field. And then after experimentation, of course, some of these add-ons go by the wayside and disappear completely and others become part of our armamentarium. Um, and they become standard of care only if well-designed studies show benefit, but I wanna highlight the importance of generalizability because just because a study shows benefit to the group of women uh, being studied or the group of fertility patients being studied does not mean it will help everybody coming to the clinic or everybody seeking care. And so that's really an important question to ask when looking at these add-ons, will it help me? Um, as we've seen, there's uh, plenty of advertising and you know, just a quick search of uh, you know, fertility success or help me get pregnant or any of these uh, keywords that, uh, that Google uses will uh, come up with a number of uh, very promising um, websites with, with uh, uh, lots of promises, 72% uh, pregnancy rate, successful pregnancy, better embryo selection, increased chance of success, helps my chances and so on. And so who, who can say no to this, right? I think that, that these are sort of presented um, in, in such a positive light with happy, cute little feet and, and happy smiling faces. Um, but of course there are pitfalls to direct to patient advertising. Uh, patients often lack the tools to critically assess claims. Patients actually may feel lucky to stumble upon the only clinic that offers treatment A, B, or C. Um, and I think the, the question that one has to ask oneself is, you know, buyer beware, why, why is this treatment not more widespread? Why is this treatment not covered by insurance? Why isn't uh, it offered by everyone if it's such a wonderful treatment? And so you have to be careful of um, promises and why the promises may be unfulfilled. Um, I use this as a kind of silly example, but this, uh, this sort of comes up often. A study at the world's best fertility center shows that 100% success rate is found in women who ate a pineapple core for breakfast. Uh, by the way, this, this was uh, presumed to help with fertility. The, the supermarket near us had run out of pineapple cores. I went in to, to buy something. They asked me why there are no pineapple cores and why women would want this. But anyways, um, wore green socks and, and carried a flowering orchid into the clinic. Now, what they don't tell you in this particular made up study is that this is a group of seven women. They were all 25 years old, had euploid embryos, had previous children, and were expected to do well. Perhaps another seven women in a different study did not have 100% success rate. But these are the kinds of things we see. And in fact, sometimes patients see these uh, presumed studies and come to me and say, well, why doctor, are you not offering me this treatment? It is so successful. And I think you should offer it to me. Don't you want me to be pregnant? And so if we step back and look at the ethics here, um, it appears that really consent is key and patient education is, is intricately uh, involved with uh, patient consent. So one has to explain the difference between experimental therapy and established care. I don't think it's always obvious uh, to patients and I don't think it's always well explained. Um, one needs to convey the treatment is unproven and considered experimental for many of these add-ons. And then discussion of, of risk versus benefit. Um, and also, it's very important to share relevant outcomes data. For some studies, for some add-ons, there's good outcomes data. For many, there's a, a lack of, uh, of uh, outcomes data. And one of the uh, comments in the Q&A was that much of these add-on questions and the conundrums we face would be solved if we had much better studies. And I believe that this is absolutely true. Um, what about the, the challenges, though, of informed consent? Certainly, we all want um, to inform our patients and make sure that they're fully aware of what's going on. But there's often a time pressure. You have to decide today or this week or this month. Um, sometimes there in, there's incomplete or, or absolutely no data. Uh, as has been said before, there, this is a stressful situation. Patients are desperate. They'll do whatever is offered to them, especially if the offer comes from a physician. Um, and there's no clear guidance. I really... Uh, I'm reassured by the traffic light system in the UK um, and the fact that there is a, a huge effort in order to try and help patients navigate this, this uh, morass of, of add-ons. Um, and there's limited robust outcomes data. Uh, it's really important to be transparent when talking about these add-ons. Um, and then coercion, and I don't mean coercion like intentional coercion, but patients may feel coerced by the media and advertising, you know, family, why don't you try everything to, to get pregnant, society, and, and certain medical personnel. There are clinics in the U.S. where 100% um, of cycles or, or virtual 100% um, undergo PGT for aneuploidy. Um, and so that's, that's what's offered. You know, you almost don't have a choice. 
uh, the patient is often the subject in many unproven innovations. There is no outcomes data until later. And in some cases, this is done post-marketing. And so a treatment is offered, um, it's available, and then the uh, company or the lab that offers the treatment reaches out to the fertility centers or the patients and says, well, you know, what were your outcomes? How did you do? Did you get pregnant? Did you have improved uh, you know, success? And this is really um, troubling because I don't think patients are aware that they're actually research subjects. And not only are they research subjects, but they're not being paid for being research subjects and taking this risk, but they are actually paying for the you know, honor um, of being uh, research subjects. Um, and they may be paying for unproven or potentially harmful treatments that may be harmful to their health or harmful to their uh, fertility outcomes. All right, so what about patient autonomy? I am in the US and we believe in uh, personal choice and, and individuality, right? And so much of the uh, treatments we offer are um, uh, either out of pocket or, or certainly there's no regulation on uh, the ability to pay for add-ons. Um, and so patients may say, look, we wanna pay a lot of money. We understand that there's a risk. We're willing to take a high risk, even if, the benefit is low or unproven, even if there's potential for harm. And then I ask another question. So, so if the physician acquiesces to providing treatment, does this imply approval or does this give false hope? So it's very important, I think, as a physician to be very honest and transparent with patients and explain why you are or are not offering a treatment. So I think sometimes patients come in and they say, I really want this. And you say, I don't think it'll help. They say, but I really want this. And if you say, well, okay, then it's sort of seen as uh, 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 you know, a vote of confidence that the treatment or the add-on might help. We have to be very careful in how we counsel um, and provide and present uh, information. But what are the physician's rights and responsibilities? You know, we talk about the patients, we talk about their desires, we talk about marketing um, and add-ons and, and so on, but physicians, are they obligated to present options to patients? What if a physician doesn't believe in an add-on? You know, sometimes patients say, well, you know, why doctor are you not presenting this add-on? The person next door says that they have an X of, you know, 100%, 50%, whatever improvement in, in outcomes with this add-on. Um, so, so, you know, what is it that about you? Don't you want me to get pregnant, right? Um, what if a physician assesses the treatment will not work? What if it's not harmful, but it's costly? Is it then okay to offer it? And then, you know, the other, the flip side of it is this paternalistic to decline treatment. Who are you as a doctor to tell me what I should do? Um, or is it just simply good medical care? After all, you know, you went to, to school, you studied, you read the literature. Should you uh, then provide guidance? I believe the answer to that is yes. And of course, it goes without saying that physicians must disclose any vested interest and financial incentives in uh, the add-ons. So just in closing, I wanted to leave you with the list of, of what I see are unanswered questions that guide both myself and my thinking, and also I think should guide patients as they navigate this world of, uh, of unknown add-ons. Uh, so will this or, or might this improve my chance of success? Are there risks? The question I think many people don't ask is what if I do nothing? What if I don't use this add-on? Am I going to be harmed by that? Is, are things going to be worse? Might my outcome be the same? Um, what is the cost? Um, are there simpler, safer, less expensive options? Why is this treatment only offered by a limited number of, of clinics? Um, and then look at the data. What does it show? Can you generalize the data to me? Um, is there a comparison group? Do you even know it works? Because it worked in this group of women doesn't mean that in another group of women that went through the same treatment but didn't receive the add-on, the outcomes might have been the same. And how robust is the data? Is it statistically significant? Has it been independently peer-reviewed? Uh, I, I do believe that these are questions that will help navigate um, and, and uh, better uh, 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 help patients understand um, and physicians be very honest and transparent about these add-ons. So I'll leave it there and I look forward to uh, the conversation at the end. Thank you. So our final speaker this evening is uh, Peter Thompson. Um, Peter is the Chief Executive of the UK's Fertility Regulator, the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority, the HFEA. Peter is um, a former civil servant and he's worked in various government departments, including the Cabinet Office and the Ministry of Justice. What I want to do today really is four things. I want to sort of give you a sense of what the HFEA's aims and ambitions are in respect of add-ons. Uh, do a little bit of a kind of history lesson, a sense of a sort of overview and timeline of the work we've done since 2016. Uh, 
talk about our current rating system, which colleagues have referred to already this evening, and then possibly talk about some of the work we're starting, looking on further developing that rating system. And, uh, and perhaps I ought to start in a definitional sense, because I'm very conscious when we started this work uh, back in 2016, there was no uh, ready definition of an add-on. Um, in 2022, as you'll have heard tonight, uh, there still is no ready definition or agreed definition of an add-on. Um, the one we used uh, right back then, and I think we've stuck with, is this idea that they are uh, if you like, additional extras to standard fertility treatment, uh, which you often have to pay for. Um, I don't say that because it's necessarily the best definition, but it's certainly uh, one we've stuck with. And I think the other thing I'd want to say right at the outset is that when we started this work, um, I'm not saying we're the only person, regulatory body, looking at this sort of thing, but we were certainly one of the first. And I'm absolutely delighted in the way in which this is a debate which has gathered kind of global momentum, if you like. And I'm delighted that more and more um, professional bodies and regulators are starting to look at this. So what are our aims and ambitions? Um, we approach this. I think the first thing I want to say is that the HFEA is agnostic about add-ons. We don't start from a presumption that they are good or bad. Uh, what we're interested in is whether they work. Uh, we also started this work. Uh, regulators have a whole series of options depending on their powers in which you can try and sort of shape behavior, create incentives, make something illegal or what have you. We went about add-ons, I think, because of the sheer complexity of the topic in terms of there are so many of them, they're different things, they fall into different sorts of descriptive categories. So we went about them, I think, from the perspective of how do we put clinics and particularly patients in a position where they can make informed choices. And it seemed to us the driver there was the availability of impartial and independent evidence on them. Uh, as previous speakers have, have acknowledged, there is a huge amount of evidence out there. Um, much of it is frankly junk, uh, and it's enough to confuse anyone. And there's a whole range of studies out there which superficially look pretty impressive. They look like they come from, you know, real uh, professional journals of some sort, but actually the studies are pretty lightweight poorly evidenced, poorly constructed. Um, it is a very confusing world out there. And what we wanted to do was be, as I say, a kind of impartial and independent source of evidence to help people uh, make good choices. But the other thing we wanted to do is actually think about how we conveyed that information, because it's, it's no good, if you like, just being uh, an impartial source of evidence if that evidence is so complex that only specialists can understand it. So one of the things we've tried to do throughout, and in many respects this is the most difficult of the tasks, is how do you convey subtlety and sophistication in as simpler a way as possible? It's really straightforward to convey the complex in a complex manner. It's really quite difficult uh, at conveying subtlety in a, in, a, in a simple manner. And that's uh, one of the things we've been trying to do throughout. So that's where we start from. Uh, brief history lesson. Uh, as I say, uh, our authority, our board, uh, made a decision back in 2016 that this was an issue, certainly in the UK, that we needed to address in a regulatory sense. And we came up with this idea of a, of a traffic light rating system, which I will describe in, in, in the next slide uh, as early as 2017. And we've been sort of developing that um, since, really continuously developing. So although the traffic light ratings themselves, you know, look pretty similar uh, over a number of years, actually there's been a number of quite subtle changes in it. But because um, add-ons are, if you like, a problem of both supply and demand, in other words, the issue here is in what way are clinics, professionals supplying add-ons and in what way are patients demanding them? And I thought Satu gave a, a, a you know, a, a very telling account of 
the extent to which for many patients this you know the demand issue is absolutely overwhelming you can well see why there's a huge call for this we also established in 2018 uh, what we called a treatment add-on working group involving representatives of all the key professional bodies and the key patient charities and that was an extent to build a, a consensus if you like about how we thought what was the responsible way to issue add-ons and there's a consensus statement on our website that everyone signed up to which is meant to guide if you like uh, how they ought to be offered uh, in 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 the UK and it doesn't have regulatory teeth it's more a, a, a sort of a, you know a sense of a, an ideal model in a regulatory sense as well in 2020 uh, we developed an audit tool which allows us to our inspectors to review clinic patient information about add-ons uh, I'll say a bit more of that uh, later on uh, and we also did a, a, a survey in 2020, which where we're looking at there is the extent to which the information on our website, this, uh, this uh, traffic light system, uh, you know, actually is useful. And uh, we got a lot of positive feedback from that. And over 80% of the responses said that they found that system both useful and easy to understand. And that's been a trigger to some of the reform, the additional uh, work we're doing uh, in 2021, which I'll come to right at the end. So what is the rating system itself? It's a pretty simple system. Uh, as, it, as others have said, it's a traffic light system, green, amber, and red. Uh, we only uh, currently provide a review of uh, 11 of the most frequently offered add-ons in the UK. We haven't sought to go right across the field. And I think crucially, it's really important what we're trying to measure here. So um, what the rating system does at the moment, and we are having a look at this later, is we're looking at whether a particular add-on is effective at improving the chances of having a baby for most fertility patients. That's what we're doing. So it's quite specific. All we're looking at at the moment is whether it improves the chances of somebody having a baby. Uh, so green suggests that there's more than one qu high quality uh, randomized control trial, which obviously is, you know, if you like the gold standard of evidence, which shows that such a procedure is effective. Amber, where there is conflicting evidence from RCTs and red, where there is no evidence uh, from RCTs. Um, you know, and this does raise some quite tricky questions, as you can imagine. Uh, and uh, generally what we have set up is a procedure whereby we have a uh, an independent advisory committee it's called our scientific and clinical advances advisory committee which is a mouthful or as it says on their SCAC for short it does an annual review of the of rct evidence uh, each year that review is informed by a statistician who provides them advice about the quality of the evidence. And then this group of experts provides us with a recommendation as to whether or not these individual add-ons should be accorded this kind of rating. So what are we doing now? So, um, and here, uh, what we're trying to do really is look at whether there is a case for further refinement of this kind of model we want it to remain fit for purpose we want it to continue to uh, assist patients and really what we're doing is we're looking at two things we're reviewing the presentation in other words is still a red amber green the right way to go uh, as manuela said there are you know interesting people take meanings from colors some people read amber as being almost as good as green and other people read it in a kind of sense of nearly red um, and in the absence of greens because currently we have nothing green then amber looks the best rating and that may also influence people's decisions so there are kind of issues about whether or not red amber green is still the best way of presenting this and the other thing we're looking at is whether or not we should continue to solely function on rct and on the idea that a live birth rate is the only indicator. Are there other 
measures that are worth looking at that might be time to pregnancy as, as others have suggested um, and the problem with rcts is not that there's a problem with rcts is actually there's a dearth of them um, wish i wish there were more um, and there also are of course uh, developments recently particularly sort of big data ways of looking at uh, evidence that may also offer some re re robust indications of effectiveness um, but it does, I mean, all of this is quite complex stuff. So this work is ongoing. Uh, we shall be going out to consultation shortly. We'll be looking at an authority decision probably in the late summer. It's quite possible we'll be sticking with the system we've got. It's possible we might be making some subtle or indeed some quite radical changes. Um, that will take, as I say, some months to, even if they make a policy decision in the late summer, for us to then actually go ahead and review evidence in the light of that new framework. But that's where things are anyway, uh, from a regulatory perspective in the UK. So I'll stop there. The first question is some, from um, someone who is, wishes to remain anonymous, and that is, um, in the UK, a green uh, traffic light add-on um, is ICSI for the treatment of male infertility. However, ICSI is used for many other circumstances, for example, for the treatment of previous fertilization failure or pro ovarian response. These are clearly not a green, yet they are not accounted for. Um, how here a, a patient in the UK may mistakenly assume that ICSI for any purpose is also green. Do you think that? Um, Add all add-ons need to be explicitly um, spelled out. So I think if we go to Peter first, um, because in your presentation just now you said there are no greens, um, so perhaps you can sort of clarify that bit first and then um, we'll come to the other speakers perhaps. I think we view ICSI for male factor infertility as not being an add-on in the sense that it's actually the only treatment option. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, so I, I, I think I think, and it's rather like uh, a previous speaker said, they didn't view PGD as, a, as a, an add-on. And I agree entirely because again, you know, it's your only treatment option if you fall into that category. So that's where we come from here. And I realize that can be uh, complicated because there are so many of these things. But as I say, uh, you know, I think it's, it's a classic case of something that can be used for the correct purpose and for an incorrect purpose. And that's why uh, we, we don't rate, uh, you know, ICSI for male for, for infertility. We don't consider it to be an adult. And um, Kirsty, you mentioned um, ICSI in your presentation. Do you agree with Peter there? Um, well, as I said, we, we discussed this to quite some length and we decided that we have these selective add-ons uh, and that would ICSI, PGTA and some other things, freeze or perhaps would fall into those categories because as you correctly said, they can be used for the correct indication and they can be used for an indication which is at least not proven to be beneficial. So, and I think we should have, as this uh, chat person uh, mentioned, I think maybe we should divide them and, and specify more for these special types of procedures that they are selective, that can be used correctly or incorrectly. So I, I would prefer to keep them as a sort of add in the incorrect situation, yes. And um, Sigal, how is um, ICSI viewed and used in, in the US? <laughs> Um, again, I think it's very variable. Some centers will use it only when needed. Some centers use it for everyone. Um, and, uh, you know, many insurances will cover it uh, for everyone. And sometimes uh, insurances question it and they come back and they, they ask you if uh, you have an indication. So it's really quite variable. I, I can't say that there's any standard of care and uh, and patients many times don't even um, actually ask about ICSI and embryologists sometimes feel more comfortable doing ICSI for some, all, none, um, and it's left uh, kind of at the center's discretion. Great, and I think um, there is some confusing um, terminology um, in this area as well when we um, talk about, because uh, Peter just mentioned uh, PGD, um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, um, and that's now called um, 
PGTM um, for menogenic disorders. Um, and then there's PGTSR for structural chromosome rearrangements. Um, and there's PGTA, the aneuploidy one. Um, and then I think there's a question about um, PGTP that we'll perhaps get to um, um, as, we, as we go through the questions. But um, it is, um, I think, confusion, so we say um, at best, and sometimes can be a bit, um, it's very easy to see how patients can get very confused as well when they're, when they're trying to read about this and to understand it, particularly when the name change is, is relatively new. And so it's not easy to sort of trace it, trace it back necessarily. Um, does anybody else want to come back actually on that ICSI point, um, Satu or Manuela? Or should we move on to the next question? Can Manuela? I just make a comment? I, I personally asked in many of the interviews I had with professional if they considered ICSI and add-on or not, because I was curious, because if you follow the definition, is if in some cases can be optional. And I, I didn't hear anyone saying that they considered this an add-on. But to be fair, looking at the data internationally, the UK has quite a, uh, let's say, limited percentage of ICSI in a, on average in the country, while there are other countries where this is clearly a more significant problem where the average is close to 80, 90, even 100 percent. And therefore, it depends on the situation. I think in the UK, this has never been a significant issue because it's closer to the 50 percent, which seems more similar to the data related to male infertility. And therefore, this is why the perception is like this. But yeah, I can confirm that all the conversation we had, uh, ICSI was always considered like because it's for male infertility mainly. And uh, therefore, it's not considered uh, an add-on in this sort of context. I, this was my two cents. Great. OK, the next question is from Daniel Bryson. Um, I'm shocked to hear that many patients are unaware of the risks of add-ons. Patients should be informed of potential risks to mother and child, but also the risk of the add-on on actually reducing their chances of success. They seem to be being sold as either beneficial or benign, which is not always the case. Does the panel think that we can what does the panel think we can do to get this message um, about risks out more clearly? And I think I'll go to, um, to Satu first with that one for the patient perspective. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I would say in this case that the responsibility is uh, uh, for the doctor who is suggesting this uh, add-on to the patient to tell about the risks. They, they probably tell about the advantages and benefits, but also they need to emphasize the risks, that it is very clear to the patient, both sides. And Manuela, what did your research show with this? Um, this was one of the point of our suggestion, but I have to say that, especially looking at the part of research we dedicated on the production of evidence, this is part of the problem, because there was in the last few years an attention and a focus in the scientific community to focus on one outcome so that then this RCT could be compared, because of course this is one of the main issues, why we don't have evidence many times is because RCTs are even difficult to compare in terms of their outcome, and therefore they focus on life birth rate, and it's difficult to establish certainly if something is actually risky or not, because we have the same problem of production of evidence. So sometimes, uh, you know, we have to, uh, to first assess the evidence to actually say that something is risky or not. I think what can be done is look at the available evidence and make very clear that the available evidence are suggesting a thing or another, especially in, in case of risk and potential harm uh, for patients, but it's a problem that should go back, let's say, to the scientific community and allow them to have multiple outcomes in the RCT so that a variety of outcomes can be measured, which is part of the problem, I believe, in the production itself of the evidence in this field. And Kirsty, would you want to come on this, both as a sort of a, an embryologist and also um, as the co-chair of the working, Eshery Working Group? Uh, yes. Um, first, I would just like to say that I'm not shocked that it, this is happening uh, because I, I think 
I, I completely agree with Daniel that it's totally wrong, but I'm not shocked because I'm so aware of that it is happening. I, I have to say I was more shocked of what Satya said that a lot of patients don't even know that they are being subjected to an add-on. It's being done without their knowledge. And if I may, um, perhaps I'm, I'm going <laughs> too much, but come back to the issue of the, of the ICSI, because if you do ICSI, when it's not indicated, you have a perfectly healthy sperm sample and healthy patient and you do ICSI and you charge for it. And you don't tell the patients, you say to the patients, you know, you, we do X for every, everyone. Is this, uh, is, is this, th then you haven't informed the patient correctly, I think. And I, I think you're subjecting the patient for, uh, again, to, to an add-on, which is uh, not correct. So uh, I, I agree that this is, um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's complicated and it's difficult. I don't know what else to say in this reading, but uh, yeah. and um, Sigal, I could see you nodding. Um, so, yeah. is there something you wanted to add in? No, there? no, I just I completely agree with Satya. I mean, it's certainly not the responsibility of the patient um, to bring up the question of whether this is risky or beneficial. I mean, it is the responsibility of the physician. However, I agree with the other panelists that many of these issues have little data or limited data. And so the way I, I like to look at it is to use what, what I call a shared decision-making model where you know, we discuss you know, what are your goals? What do I know about the science? Um, and together we'll say, is it worthwhile? You know, will you feel better if you do this? If it's not harmful to you, it might cost you money and so on. And sometimes I get to this point where I say to the patients, look, I, I don't think that this will help you. If you want to give me your money, you can give me your money, but I really don't want to take your money because I just don't think this will help you. And hopefully like that's the strongest way I can say to someone, this isn't going to work or this has no evidence. Um, but it's certainly the, the decision and the responsibility, uh, you know, the bottom line is with the physician for sure, because patients are getting many mixed signals from many different places, some reliable and some not. Um, and it is not their responsibility, nor do they always have the tools with which to determine which add-ons might help them and which might not. And people are promised the world. And, and I feel like it's unfair because there's a very vulnerable population that uh, is being marketed to. Um, and some of these treatments work and some don't, but, uh, but who, you know, how is one to know? Um, and so we need more assistance to patients to make decisions that are beneficial to them. And Peter, as part of your review work um, on the traffic lights, do you think some, you know, do you think there's something that the HFEA could do here for, for patients in the UK in terms of information? Uh, we do already, but it's clearly not having the kind of impact we'd like it to. Daniel's right. It, you know, some things are benign and some things are risky, and that needs that that absolutely needs to be clear. I also agree with Satu and Sigal about the physician's role. It seems to me if you look at sort of doctor-patient relationships over the last 30, 40 years, we've come a long way in hearing getting patient voices heard. And I think that's been a huge step forward. But at its worst, it has allowed some clinicians to, uh, so if you like, walk away from their responsibility. And it seems to me that no responsible physician can simply offer a treatment because the patient asks for it alone. You know, there's a sort of sense, it's, it's one thing to hear patients' voices, it's another thing to agree to treatment which you think is, you know, not at all in the patient's interest. You know, what's the point of going to a doctor if you're going to abdicate responsibility like that? So I think, and I think that sort of shared decision making that Segal set out must be right. There's got to be some kind of happy medium here in which we do hear the voice of patients properly, but equally clinicians need to, you know, step up and at times give some pretty unpalatable messages about why something is just wholly inappropriate. Well, very um, powerful um, answer from you there, Peter. Um, so we will move on now to the next question, which most popular question, which is from um, Roy Hom Homburg. And it's actually, it's sort of more of a statement really, but if anyone has any ideas about how this can solve this um, old chestnut, we'd be grateful to hear them. Um, all the questions have been, um, that have been asked in this excellent symposium could be answered by well-conducted, well-powered, randomized controlled trials. So why are these not being done? There are two reasons, intolerable bureaucracy, and which is actually something we heard about quite a bit at the PET conference um, last year, and expense. Um, 
and these two are linked. Um, cure these two and we'll have all the answers. Um, so do the panel think that is actually um, a fair um, criticism of why there aren't these um, research trials? I don't know who wants to take that first. Um, perhaps we'll go to Kirsty. So this is about why is the evidence still missing? And just like Roy Holmberg still, I, I think he has a, some points in that because I think I, I've been in this business for 30 years and randomized controls trial ha, have become so much more difficult to perform. I mean, to a large extent, it's, it's fair. They should be tightly uh, regulated and, and, and of course, but they're very difficult and they usually it's it's hard to do it in your own clinic you need a lot of time and money they're usually conducted by the by the, by the medical firms or, or um, pharmaceutical companies and also i think it as as someone said i can't remember who now it's difficult to compare them because they're done, being done differently they have different patient populations different subgroups uh, you include narrow or, or, or broad in your studies and then the, the last, the blue point down here, I think what's, it's, things are moving so fast today. So sometimes you feel this is already obsolete. People have decided that made up their minds, whether it's true or not, they've made up your, their minds. And I'm thinking about the, for example, the endometrial scratching study for it from, from Sarah and, and others, where it was shown that it doesn't work but it's still being offered and it's still being performed. So if you do a fantastic study and people don't listen. So, I'm, so as you can hear, I don't have an answer to this problem, not at all, but I agree with Roy, this is, this is really part of the problem. How can we do these studies uh, in a way that we can really convince patients and professionals what to do and, and what not to do? Yes, Kirsty, I agree. I, you know, if we go back and we look at things in IVF in its infancy, none of it was randomized or controlled. We just did things and they worked and right. Um, but even if you look at things as basic as fetal heart rate monitoring, um, that was never proven. And in fact, it may not help with fetal outcomes to monitor the heart rate throughout the labor. And yet find me a physician or a patient who would feel comfortable not plopping that monitor on while they're in labor. So it's been accepted. It's not harmful on some level, but it is harmful because we do think it increases the C-section rate, um, but we haven't been able to prove that not checking improves outcomes. So, so that's on the one hand. The other um, issue with add-ons, I think, um, is the issue is of emotional benefit, which we've sort of touched upon, but not fully. And so the problem becomes that a patient goes through a fertility treatment, doesn't have success, and wants to do something different. And maybe the right thing to do is to do the same thing and just you know, play the odds again, um, but that's uh, not kind of emotionally satisfying. And so the question is, um, is there any kind of sort of um, therapeutic benefit to providing add-ons that are not harmful and maybe not expensive, um, but may have emotional benefit? I think of, you know, acupuncture um, and other such things. Um, and I'm wondering what the panel thinks about uh, about this. We, we um, talk uh, uh, in the American Society for Reproductive Medicine um, on futility of care, and on cycles in, in women who have a very low chance of success. And is it possible to offer something that we call a closure cycle where you do one more IVF cycle just so that the woman kind of has that final opportunity to say, okay, this isn't going to work before I can move on to something else, whether that be donor egg or child-free living or, or whatever she chooses to do. Um, but there is potentially a therapeutic benefit to an add-on or a treatment without benefit um, uh, in terms of outcomes pregnancy outcomes, but there may be other benefits. I just throw it out there for conversation. And I thought it was interesting that in, in Sarah's um, presentation that she had, um, you know, I mean, that still with endometrial scratch, um, about a third of um, clinicians are offering it in Australia. But it must be true generally that an inexpensive, low risk option should uh, you know there is a case for thinking about lower barriers if you like than something that is both expensive and potentially dangerous or riskier so uh, and again i think that points to the complexity of add-ons in the sense of because they cover such a wide range of things and different inter types of interventions whether they're drugs or technologies or something raise different kinds of issues um, 
one of the difficult things is providing sort of clear regulatory signals in amongst all that complexity. But I recognise what Segal says. But as I say, I think as a as a general, it, it's best done on an individual approach rather than a set of general regulatory rules. This is from someone who's anonymous. Both uh, Dr. Clipstein and Dr. Lenson mentioned PGTA. The HFEA is in the news today saying that PGTP, so that's embryo selection using polygenic scores, isn't legal in the UK. Um, t- um, because embryo selection is only legal in the UK to avoid serious inherited illnesses. Um, is th- if this is true, you should not always believe things in the media, even if it's if it's a quote from the regulator and um, you don't know, know um, then why is PGTA legal and available in the UK? So that's just for you, Peter, I think that one. Well, they're very different and they're making very different claims. It's partly simply because of the way the HFEA Act is drafted. So the Act is now pretty old, originally in 1990, uh, updated in 2008. Um, And PGTA is not really covered by the Act in any meaningful way. Whereas because there is very explicit provision about when embryo selection is appropriate, uh, that's where polygenic risk scores uh, fall over because uh, they're not for the identification of single gene defects, which is how the Act is constructed. So it's it's a historical accident of the way in which the Act is drafted, which largely predates things like uh, PGTA even, even existing. Thanks, Peter. So that's perhaps something for us to keep our eye on as, a, as the Act is um, um, thinking about being um, updated in the UK. So the next question I'm going to go to is from Maximilian Ruthenstrop. Baru, apologies if I've mispronounced your name. The efficacy validity of add-ons seems to be highly case dependent, yet the um, RAG, red, amber, green scorecard, such as the one from the HFEA, um, are by default um, at the aggregate level. How can these two be reconciled from a patient's perspective? For example, PGTA may be advisable in an individual case, yet the aggregate Um, HFEA score is read. Should patients rely on the peer-reviewed evidence or the doctor's practitioner's advice? And what additional channels or resources, e.g. second opinions, should a patient seek out? So there's quite a lot in that question. Um, So I don't know who wants to go first on that one. Um, Should we go to uh, Sigal first? Sure. So look, every every patient is an individual, and you know Peter has a big task on his on his hands because you can't possibly um, fine tune a structure for an individual patient. I, I agree with him that you know this sort of therapeutic emotional benefit can't be considered by the regulators because it's sort of a non a non issue. Um, in terms of um, of how one one generalizes. Uh, you almost can't, right? And so, so the question is, what data patients rely on? I, I do think this has to be a conversation with physicians, and and um, and you know, I can't even give general data, general information to any given patient, not knowing their history. So you need to go through the testing, you need to go through the history, and you need to individualize uh, care. And um, and so even with add-ons, I, you know, the problem with the add-ons is that there's not much data, even with with treatments that have good data, like ICSI, for an example, um, it's helpful for some patients, it's not helpful for others. Um, And so you cannot make a generalization for any of these types of things. Some of the add-ons, I I believe over time will fall by the wayside. Other ones might be more more prevalent, uh, you know, endometrial scratch, ERA. There's so many of them that we just don't have the the data on and we're just starting to, to develop data. Um, and so I, I believe that this Tahan conversation in five years will be very different. There may be new things. Um, it would be wonderful if we found things that 100% work for everyone, but that's not the reality of human reproduction or science or medicine in general. So uh, we, we definitely have our work cut out for us as doctors, as patients, as regulators, as embryologists, um, as patient advocates. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have our jobs for many years to come thinking about these questions. And I just sort of want to add another layer onto that question. Um, it was, and it because it's occurred to me during um, the event and some of the comments that have been made is, you know, do you think it would be helpful if there were um, official um, collection 
of the data of add-on use. Um, I'm, you know, reluctant to even to sort of put this out there because, um, you know, the, the collection of data in the UK, I know a lot of clinics see as a, as a great burden, um, but perhaps that could actually give some indication, um, or accurate in, in, um, indication of the prevalence. Um, and then perhaps that could be somehow linked to outcome uh, um, as well. I mean, I know that would be very simplistic because you wouldn't be taking into lots of account lots of other factors, but is that something that you would consider even doing, Peter? Um, there's certainly a possibility. So we do collect some data, but not all. And that again comes down to the sorts of things we're required to collect by law. Um, and I think there is an opportunity. So I know that clinics have in the past regarded sort of the submission of data as a burden, but I would make two comments, one of which is we only hold a small subsection of what clinics hold automatically. So the records that clinics have, it's always more detailed than what we say, so you know, they don't collect any data on our behalf that they wouldn't collect automatically. And with the new data submission system we've, uh, re we're rolling out, uh, the submission of data should be very much easier. So that may provide an opportunity longer term for a conversation about whether or not we could, in certain cases, collect certain bits of data. And we wouldn't necessarily have to do it for all time. It may well be with advice from statisticians, we could collect data on certain things for say 12 months or something or other that might then give us a big enough block of data that we could do some useful analysis with or we could farm it out to universities or researchers like Daniel Bryson who I know on the call to, to do some work with so there are some real possibilities there but us collecting real world aggregate data is not the same as an RCT that doesn't mean it's not valuable but it does mean that you know one can draw all sorts of useful uh, conclusions from our data, but it's not, uh, it doesn't have quite the same power as a well-designed RCT. So that's a long-winded way of saying, I think there's a possibility in the future, so watch this space. Um, I'm going to go go to the bottom of the list, actually, and go to a question from Melanie Davis. And she asked, would the panel like to comment on the industries that have grown up around AART for complementary therapies, such as nutritional advice, coaching, um, and whether they regard, I suppose, these as, as, as add-ons um, to fertility treatment and, and what should be done. So, um, so, Manuela, did this come up in your research, these complementary therapies and nutrition? Um, yeah, some of these things, as, as I showed at the beginning, the picture included a lot of variety of things. So the, we also had patients in the interview mentioning things, especially like acupuncture, things like this. Um, from from the general research, I would say I would say two things. One thing is that it's essential to this to make a clear distinction on what these things are claiming, uh, because of course, if the claim is that certain of these things can increase the number of babies born, this is a big claim, and it's going to be very difficult to support this sort of claim. But many of the patients we interview were actually talking about their personal. Um, sort of, it was beneficial for the stress, for going through IVF. Uh, we know how emotionally difficult this can be. And I believe in that case, if the information is clear and it doesn't suggest things that are not proven, um, it should be, it, it's, it's fair enough to be left to the personal decision of the person that are uh, going through um, certain uh, of this, I don't know if calling them treatment or complementary uh, medicine more probably. And Satu, I'd like to bring you um, in on this one as well. Um, has this yes. come up? Yes, definitely. Uh, in my little survey, I also asked about these treatments or add-ons. And a lot of people replied that they have tried acupuncture and vitamins and, and, and things like that. So yes, they patients are using those two a lot. 